several years back in the late 80s and up and up and up through the 90s there had been multiple disappearances uh with very strange circumstances um such as you know finding cars sitting in a highway with the, the occupants gone uh, a fellow who had um who had uh crashed uh, belly flopped an airplane into the woods actually did a vertical drop through the canopy and was able to walk away and he was walking uh, out to a lake to be picked up and he never made it and um he, he completely disappeared um and when they got to looking around there were a, a uncanny lot of disappearances of people in the area so uh, in the meantime uh i had been doing a lot of research there in uh northeast well in that area and in northeast mississippi just right across the state line just a few miles away and i had become fairly well known to uh, uh, some of the law enforcement uh, officers as well as rangers and stuff on some of uh you know state and federal lands in that area uh out of the blue a um a fella an investi a guy who i found out later was an investigator for the mississippi bureau of investigation contacted me he first he wanted to wanted me to take him out and you know show him uh, around in some Bigfoot areas you know take him out in the woods. Well, by the grace of God or by lucky, he actually got to see one. And um, after that, and he sort of got over that shock, he <laughs> re- revealed to me that he had sort of an ulterior motive that he he had heard about me and. He was, you know, trying to figure out if I was, you know, full of stuff or not. And um, so um, he had, you know, seen firsthand that I wasn't. And so he and he had seen me call him. Um, that's one of the things Bear and I have done for years is, is you know, we, we can successfully call him. Uh, but anyway, let's stay to the point of the story is that um, then he started asking me questions about him, about, you know, if I thought that they would prey on people and such. Mm-hmm. And I had heard enough stories by that point and had investigated enough stuff, which I, I've i got some good ones about Bigfoot and guns that uh, since you were talking about shooting that uh, I can tell here in a little bit later. But anyway, I told him absolutely. Then he told me, you know, he asked me if I was familiar with these disappearances. I said, oh, yes. And But he said, well, let me tell you what else, what happened. He said, we we were had become convinced Alabama Bureau of Investigation plus the Mississippi Bureau of Investigation had become a convinced that there was probably a serial killer stalking that area and, you know, stopping people or, or you know, maybe some kind of an old hermit or something that uh, that had, you know, was living back there in the boonies somewhere. But they couldn't really get a grip on it because it was over such a, a large area. In, the, in their investigation, they discovered a large hobo jungle or hobo camp along the Norfolk Southern Main Line railroad line that cut through that area, through a very desolate area that goes from the Muscle Shoals, Alabama, down through Russellville, Alabama, and cuts cross country, goes down through Jasper, Alabama, and ends up down in Birmingham. And in that area between Russellville and Jasper, out in that wilderness area north of Carbon Hills in the south part of uh, the Bankhead National Forest, they found this big hobo jungle. So they decided to raid it and that there's a good chance that somebody in the hobo jungle might be the killer or they would know something. So they went in there, raided the thing, had the paddy wagons and everything, loaded them all up, rounded up, uh, up everybody. Apparently they was quite an operation. They came in, they surrounded the place so that nobody could get away. And none of this ever made the news or anything. So they they kept the guys, they you know, locked them up. Then they then they separated them, and they started questioning them individually about disappearances and about this stuff. Well, what came out during the questioning was that they said, yeah, they'd heard about that. They said, but hell, we've been having people disappear out of the camp and around the camp, you know, hobos for years. And well, so and so even saw, oh, you know, Billy Bob get nabbed, and uh, hell, it was some kind of a big old hairy monster, you know. And one guy said, well, it was a, it was a Sasquatch that got them, you know. And they they heard this from several different hobos, and that's when they they started, you know, putting two and two together, and that's you know they started trying to hunt down somebody that knew about them, and 
I don't know who else they talked to. I was not, I'm not the only investigator or person that knows about it in that area by any means. But, you know, I was one of the ones that they decided to, to ask about it. And interesting thing, they asked me, why would this be more prevalent in March and April? And I said, well, for one reason, yeah, it's beginning to green up a little bit down in that area. I said, but there's no food left. All the all the nuts and the, and the stuff and mast from the fall is gone, long gone. There's nothing, no no gardens have been planted uh, that that have been planted have anything good enough to eat in them yet. There's nothing, there's no fruit or or berries or anything out yet. And I said at this point in, in the year they're living off just about pure protein, and and they'll get it any way that they can, and. I said, there's a chance. I said, usually they kill deer and, you know, coyotes. They steal, you know, steal dogs and cats and stuff and rabbits and, you know, get whatever they can get. They'll nab pigs and chickens and, uh, uh, you know, they'll, they'll get it where they can. But there are those out there that are sort of rogues or old deposed alphas that have had their butts whipped multiple times by the young, by the younger up and coming, uh, males. And, or have had injuries or something, and they need something to eat. they got to have something to eat. You know, right. They may not be able to run down a deer anymore, but they can sure catch a human. And, you know, they're eating them. So, and that's the, that brings around. Well, uh, I know there was uh, that, supposedly that red-headed cannibal giants that a lot of Native Americans claim existed. Right. Do you think that that's a relationship to this these type of Bigfoot stories? Oh uh, yes, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, there's uh, there's there's always some basis in fact for for some of the, you know for for these Native American stories. If mm-hmm. you really delve into them and and um, and study them and spend the time to 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 learn about them. You know, now sure, a lot of the stuff is told as a, as a, you know, just as a, as a warning or a, or to to teach them or just for good entertainment around the camp. Right. But, you know, not all of them are just you know stuff that they pull out of their butt to try to care, you know, scare the kids. Mm-hmm. A lot of them have have a have a basis in fact. Have we found and, any uh, people, uh, missing people that eventually turn up that have uh, been chewed on, and we could tell that it's oh, it's not just. At, you know, mountain lions and and deer and whatever you know, evil squirrels okay. are out there. Since you all right, here here's you. This is this is one of the stories I was wanting to tell you because this is a very well cor- corroborated report. Okay. And um, in back in the eighties and nineties, I was associated with the Boy Scouts as an assistant scoutmaster or a scoutmaster with a couple of different troops, and. Uh, at this time, I was uh, working with scouts over in the um, northwest Alabama area, and we were planning a camping trip to the Land Between the Lakes recreation area there in, uh, that straddles the uh, Kentucky-Tennessee border. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with it or not, but it, it, uh, it's bordered on one side. by It's a really long peninsula of, of tens of thousands of acres of land that's bordered on the, uh, along the east side by the... Cumberland River and on the west side by the Tennessee River and it's a uh, uh, it's now a uh, sort of like a national park but it's, it's considered to, they call it a national recreation area it is split into two halves a north south and a ha- and a south half by a highway I think it's highway 68 goes through there um, it runs east and west through the land between the lakes and, and basically breaks it into like I said north and south half. We were we were trying to figure out where we wanted to go camping over there, so I called a friend of mine, a guy that I grew up with, had known since since I was in diapers, that um, was a couple of years older than me, and he was a law enforcement ranger up there at the land between the lakes at that time. And so I called him up and told him, you know, hey, uh, you know, I'm working with a, a scout troop there and uh, area where we were from, and um, we're wanting to come up there and do some camping and uh, stay about three days. And and you know, where would you recommend you know, a good place to camp? And he said, Well, you you can camp anywhere you want. That's the good thing about land between the lakes. You can just anywhere you want to go, you can camp. You do not have to camp in organized campgrounds. He said, But let me tell you, 
stay south of Highway 68. And he, and he suggested a couple of good campgrounds. I said, well, a lot of the boys like to fish, so he told me a couple of them that were on the waterfront. We ended up cho- choosing one of them. And I said, well, why south of 68? He said, well, he said, can't really talk about it now, but, uh, you know, he said, uh, what, when are you thinking, of, when are y'all coming? So I told him the weekend. He said, oh, I'm working that weekend, so uh, I'll drop by and visit. So we go camping at the, at the place there in the south end of the, of the, uh, of LBL, and, uh, sure enough, he came by to visit, and we've sitting around the campfire talking, and it's after dark, and and uh, he uh, he says uh, he said, well, you know, I'll 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 come back, you know, tomorrow and show you around a little bit because I was not real familiar with the area. So next day he uh, he comes back, and so um, we got in his car, and. Uh, I know now that that probably was not a uh, – <laughs> you know, he was probably putting his neck out a little bit. But like I said, we've been friends, grew up in the same church and everything together. So off we go riding around, and he says, well, you know, you were asking me about why, uh, uh, you know, why you want to stay south of, uh, of Highway 68. And I said, yeah. And he says, well, he said, have you heard about the killings that happened up here? And I said, well, no, I hadn't. So the first thing he told me about was, uh, and you can look this up. This is, I'm not going to talk about it very much, but you can uh, do a search on the Beast of Land Between the Lakes or the Beast of LBL and look at look for a story written by a lady by the name of Jan Thompson. And um, anyway, it's uh, it's there's more documentation to it than than what she tells. And I had heard this. Um, I had heard some, once he got to telling me about that, I remembered, oh, yeah, I think I had heard something about that, but I thought it was just hooey, you know. And he said, well, let me tell you what happened here just a few years ago. And he was working there when this happened. And there was a bow hunter in there, so this was, this was early fall. And, um, again, the guy had come in, and he had, you know, he'd gotten his camping permit, and he'd gone out, and he had uh, found him a place to camp, and, and uh, he'd been in there for several days, and, and he was, you know, had told his wife when he was going to come back. In fact, I think on your pass you have to tell him how many days you're going to be in there. Well, the guy never showed up back home. His wife called and said, hey, you know, my husband, you know, went up there bow hunting and, you know, he never came back. Well, she, uh, they got to looking. Well, sure enough, yeah, this guy had checked in. And and I think you have to give a description of your vehicle or she may have given him a description. And well, one of the rangers said, well, hey, I... I remember, you know, I've, I've seen that truck up there, you know, at this particular location off of one of the side roads, off of what they call the trace, the main drag that goes north and south through the, through the, um, uh, through the, through LBL. They said, yeah, he's just right off the, right off the east side of the trace, uh, back up in the edge of this meadow. He's got, he, I've seen his truck and he's got a, you know, his, his camp there. So they went up there looking for him. Well, they get pulled up there and his truck's sitting there, sure enough, it's like they said. But his damn tents tore all to hell, and his his campground is wrecked. And they start looking for him, and they can't find him. And they start bringing in more people, and this, based on what had happened several years before of a family a family of four that was brutally slaughtered, and some of them partially eaten, um, they knew that that they better take take this dead serious so there was a lot of folks that were brought in there and my friend was part of the part of the search search party that was looking for him they end up getting tracking dogs in and and hired some some good trackers and they found a par- fairly easy easy to to uh to follow trail and they and it was headed headed to the east <clears throat> they followed it for nearly two miles along the way they found would find you know a scrap of cloth here or maybe a piece of clothing there, blood such as that. It was uh, an easy to follow trail. My friend told me they were crossing another meadow, an isolated little meadow out in the in the forest, and somebody hollered, and they looked up and he was pointing up in the trees. They looked up and about thirty feet up in this large tree, there was the guy's body. And when they thirty, got up there, 30 was, feet up in a tree, yes, way up in a tree. Mm-hmm. It was a it was a large tree. It was a large tree, probably a large oak. And uh, but he said it was he said it was around thirty feet up in the tree, hanging hanging up there in a limb. Um, 
And they got closer, and they could tell that his body had been fed on. They, when they got him down, he he had been ripped up tremendously. I mean, had very large claw marks and stuff in him. Um, in places, a lot of the bones in his body had been broken. And, oh, by the way, his head was turned around backwards. Oh, by the way. I like how yeah, you throw oh, that in way. as an aside. So yeah. what, what attacking like, and a lot of people don't know this, but some animals will store their food in a tree up right. higher to keep it away from other scavengers. So right. this that's very much like what this find yeah. is appearing to be, right? Right. However, in the in the previous incident that had happened there several years earlier where the family of four were slaughtered by a beast that, that slashed them all up and they found they were they were up on that so fast that they they were searching for a little girl that they knew that was missing. They found three of the bodies. They found the mother, the father and the and the little boy and they knew that there was a daughter gone somewhere and they were out searching and one of the police officers walked underneath the tree a tree and was standing there and something was is dripping on his hat and he looks up and he gets blood dripping right in his face so that's how 